So, hi everyone. Uh, I appear to be about a minute late, so apologies for that. I uh, want to start just by saying, we're tying up a bit of administration. I uh, have done the plans now for these stools. They are available on the website, but for anyone who is watching now, and anyone watching on the replay up to this time tomorrow, so 3 p.m. on the 2nd of February, you can get to those plans at 50% off by uh, emailing me direct at plans at womade.co.uk. Now we're going to be having Srinik joining to moderate uh, in a little moment. Uh, he's just tying up something his end. So at the moment the chat's un, uh, unwatched, but please do put in who you are, where you're calling from, and uh, we'll carry on with that a little bit later. I shall check on it from time to time, and I'll say hopefully Shrek will be with us in a few minutes. Now, uh, if you're new to the stream, basically what I like to do is a bit of woodwork here, uh, nothing too majorly complex, just showing you what you can get up to, showing different joints maybe, doing little projects, and I'm going to be continuing that uh, for the foreseeable future because I'm enjoying it and the feedback's uh, quite good too. So uh, loving you all joining me for it. Um, at the moment I'm doing 3 p.m.s on uh, Mondays and uh, 7, no sorry, 9 p.m. on Wednesdays and that's Greenwich Mean Time. If you subscribe to my channel and you also select the notifications icon and select all notifications then you will hear in uh, plenty of time uh, that I'm live streaming. So any changes to the, that current schedule uh, you'll get to hear about. Right, well we've been building for the last few uh, streams a pair of uh, what I call mortising stools. Uh, they can also be thought of as shorter saw horses and I'm thinking they're going to be really useful to me. Hopefully it will be to you as well. I'm going to talk about um, finishing them off and I basically have finished them off now so let's go and have a, a quick little look. So let me just come over and put you on this camera, that's a bit better. So here are the two stools. Uh, last time you saw this one, it was still in pieces, so I've glued it up since then. I have done a couple of little things to it, which I'll explain. The legs are splayed, as you can see, and uh, the top board wasn't, but it was always the intention to uh, make those co-planar. So what I've done is I've planed uh, a bevel on the top surface here, so it's in plane with the legs. So it's all lovely and flush. I've also flushed off the top of the joints here. And I've run a, a plane over the half joints in the legs. So just taking off the little excess I left on length. And uh, just smoothing out this half joint. And uh, Now ideally with a half joint you'll get it so it's um, completely flush straight off the glue up. But uh, usually you'll be able to feel with your fingertips. A slight step. So what I've done, I've just flushed that up. Uh, that's about it. There was one other thing I was going to do, which I will show you. When you're carrying these around, and they are really portable, and they're uh, excellent for, for moving around a, a work site or around the home, wherever you want to use them. Uh, they're not heavy because they're made of softwood, and I find the easiest way to, to carry them is from one of the stretchers. So to aid in that, what I've been doing is just going around the stretcher with a block plane, but you could equally do this uh, with, um, with sandpaper or, or a larger plane. Just taking a little bit off on the corners so we don't have any sharp edges. So literally just a few thin shavings off and it just makes it that bit more comfortable to carry around. You can also carry these on your shoulder, so you want to make sure that you do the top surfaces of the stretchers and make those comfortable as well.
So, how do we actually use them? Uh, and this is something I was pondering on how to demonstrate these to you. Uh, it's, it's very tricky uh, to, to give an impression of how easy it is to use or how, uh, how easy it is to see what you're doing. So if I was going to be cutting a mortise here and say this piece of wood, the idea is to sit on it so you don't have to clamp it. So wood straight to the, the stool, sit on it and away you go. And one of the comments I, I had earlier on was you can't see where the chisel's upright. Well if you're sitting back here uh, looking in this direction, if I line this up for you like so, so basically you're seeing what I would see now. I think you can see that you can tell in this plane uh, whether you're holding your chisel upright. And then simply whilst you're sitting down lean over a bit so what I mean is I'm sitting here chopping my mortise I just lean my head around there then I get this sort of view so I can also see whether I'm upright or not so I've got all those bases covered on a piece of stock which is this length which is very common for sort of household furniture fits on one stool do your mortise on the far end there, sitting on it, holding it down, no problems at all. If I wanted to do a mortise in the middle here, I can't really sit on it. So just use a clamp. It's easy enough to clamp your work and you can mortise. The other advantage of course is you're sitting down so it's much more comfortable than standing around pounding out mortises. If you're working on something that's a bit smaller, say like this, then uh, it becomes a little more tricky. Putting a clamp on it in the middle of the bench might be difficult for you. So why not use a screw clamp? Screw that down. You could even sit on that as well and work on it. So holding the work on there is really quick to, to organise works really well. If you've got a really long piece of work, which I can't demonstrate in here because I don't have anything particularly long, but you've got the two benches. You can either put them like so, in lengthwise. Really the one you're not chopping on you can have any way you like. They're stable because of the wide legs, so when you're pulling stock across them they're not going to fall over. And I've also designed it so that you can put one up in a T position to it, to the other one. That may be useful. They also stack because of the legs. So there was always a worry that uh, it might take up too much room or too much floor space in the workshop. But it only takes up the floor space of one of them, which is handy. Now you may have been wondering why I made one with legs slightly narrower than the other and possibly some of you have worked this out it's because I can put these legs in there that gives me a slot down the middle so for sawing purposes if I want to, to saw through a thin board I can place it on there run my saw in between and it supports both sides of the wood so sawing wise it works as well and obviously you can space them out and I think at uh, just over two foot long you could actually support probably an 8 by 4 board and break it down on these. Maybe I'll try that out in future. So that's pretty much what they do. Um, oh, sawing wise of course when you're sawing you would normally be supporting the back of the work with one knee and holding it with the other, so sawing like so. And of course it works well like that because the height is, well for me it does, the height is just right for my knee. And I now have, because my other saw horse, uh, my other sawing bench is a little bit lower, uh, since building that I've got myself a full size hand saw, so I need a bit more height. Uh, these will work out just fine for that. 
So hopefully you can see that that's working quite well. Uh, we will be testing it, or I will be testing it out, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Now with a bit of luck, my friend is here to take over moderation of the channel. So Shrenik, are you with us? Hello, I'm here now. Hi, we've got Shrenik, Shrenik with us now. Good to, see, good to hear from you, Shrenik. Well, we have Chester here. Chester's here as well. Hi, Chester. Yes, Chester has just uh, popped up in the chat. Excellent. So, uh, I often plug Bench Talk 101 in these, and Chester and Shrenik are both regulars at that. So, uh, if you want to find some interesting woodworking going on in the evening to listen to, then do check out Bench Talk 101 on YouTube and on Instagram and Facebook. And Thursday evenings, 8.30 GMT, you'll find a good hour, possibly up to about half a dozen hours of woodworking talk. So, moving on. What did I use to make these? Because I was quite interested to see how many tools I actually needed to make them. And so I kept aside everything that I used and I've put it down on the bench here. I'm pretty certain I've got everything here. Um, if anyone spots anything that's missing, please do tell me, but I think it's covered here. And I'm going to go through here and take out the tools which I could have done without, because that'll give you an idea of if you want to make it yourself, maybe you've got a limited number of tools, give you an idea of what you actually need. So let's go through from this end. I've got some planes. Now, most of the stock preparation I did with my number eight and my number five. But to be perfectly honest, I could have done it all with the number five. So we can get rid of this guy. Uh, for smoothing, I used my number four and a half. Well, I could have just raised the iron a little in my number five and done it with that. The wood is perfect, this softwood is perfectly okay to be smoothed uh, with the same iron. We don't need a different uh, bevel on the iron or anything. So that would have been fine. I used a couple of block planes, one set coarse, one set fine. And I would say that it's very handy to have the smaller plane to do a lot of the tasks I did, but I could equally have done all of that with the number five as well. So let's get rid of those two. I also used router planes. Uh, the little one I used to uh, take the, the full depth of cut into the, the groove I used for the gussets. Now, I could equally have done that just with a mortise chisel, uh, checking regularly with, or checking the depth with a ruler or with, uh, you know, depth calipers. So I didn't need that really, so we can get rid of that. The larger router plane, I used that for, now let me think, I think it was for bottoming out the mortises for the tops of the legs and also for the halving joints. Well, it does really speed that up and it takes away a lot of checking that you'd have to do by hand uh, for flatness and uh, so it is really nice to have, but again, it's not something you need. So let's take that one away. Bit of wax just to help the planes move around. Uh, that's optional, but it really does help. So I'm going to leave that one there. Sticking with uh, edge tools, chisels. Well, I only used three. Uh, the mortise chisel to help take out the groove for the gussets. Um, actually, it just reminded me of a tool that I don't have here, I have put away, and that was the um, Stanley combination plane, which I plough the groove with, so you don't need that either, because you can cut your groove with a mortise chisel, with a saw, and basically chop it out, so that's already gone. So I do need the mortise chisel, or I need at least a chisel narrow enough 
to take the material out for the gussets. So that's a narrow chisel, bevel edge would be perfectly okay. I used this uh, firmer, which is about a three quarter inch, which equates to just over 16 mil. That's nice for flattening the bottom of the, or for chopping out and flattening the bottom of the top of the leg mortises. So I think that's necessary, but I could also have used that on the halving joints for the legs, so I wouldn't have needed the large pairing chisel. So we can get rid of that one. So gradually we're getting less and less tools. Uh, measuring and marking out next, you will need uh, a square of some sort. I used two, you only really need one, and the small to medium size engineer's tri-square would be perfectly okay. I used winding sticks because my stock wasn't perfectly flat, uh, but these can be shop made, so don't worry too much about those. Uh, I've got a video on how to make those, so just check that one out. For actual measurements, most of my measurements I took uh, directly from one part to another, but I did make use of these rules at some point, either checking depth, double checking depth, uh, that sort of thing. But I could have done all that I needed to do uh, with a tape rule. So we can get rid of all the steel rules. I used a couple of marking knives, uh, but to be honest, on a project like this, you don't need the, the ultra fine accuracy of those. You can get away with a, a very sharp pencil or a, a fine propelling pencil. So I'll happily take those marking knives away. A gauge, so a marking gauge, I use that quite a lot in this. Uh, I've got my pencil modification on here as well, and that came in handy. So a marking gauge, I think we'll leave in the mix. Pencils, as I've said. Um, the calipers, I did use to quickly check the thickness of halvings for the joints, uh, check the depth of um, the, what was it, the gusset groove, so that was useful, but again, that's not essential, so we can get rid of that. <laughs> Moving on to saws, I used uh, three saws, as far, no, I used four saws, I did initially cut with a universal saw, the rough lumber. Uh, I could have done everything I've done, either with that combination uh, cheap panel saw, even cutting the joints I could have done with that. Or I could have done it all with a single Ryober. So I'm going to leave a single Ryober here. Get rid of the Dazuki and the other Ryober. And I could have cut actually all the rough cuts again with this Ryober. So just one saw needed. Uh, as far as hitting things, um, I used no hammers but I did use a mallet and I used a soft blow mallet uh, for assembly. Things do swell a little bit with glue applied and I did use that on a couple of the joints just to make sure they went home nicely. Uh, you could get away with either a hammer, a mallet, um, and that's probably it. You wouldn't need necessarily the soft blow hammer, so we'll take that away. And I took the option of putting dowels in at the top of the legs, which helped with the assembly. Uh, with the glue applied, it just meant that things went together and didn't slip apart so easily. It also gives a little bit of added security if the glue joint uh, isn't that great. So I, I would like to leave in the hand drill with the doweling bit. Uh, that's basically it for tools, except for some wedges and I used wedges for the glue up because the legs are splayed at 8 degrees and clamping across something that's uh, splayed in wedge shaped fashion the clamp doesn't want to hold properly it wants to slip to the narrower end but if you just pop on a couple of wedges it really helps and again they can be made in the shop. Now I did clamp things together so add a couple of clamps but even, even if you don't have clamps, you could use um, some thick cord and this just make a, 
uh, not what you call it, we put a stick through, twist it around just to tighten it up, like a tourniquet type thing. So you could get away without any clamps as well. So it's really a very small kit of tools that you need to build these. And I think it's within everyone's ability to do that, uh, probably with what they've got around, uh, maybe with the purchase of just uh, one or two other tools. Okay, well, do we have any questions at this point? And um, and that's why they're possibly so so much larger than others. Oh, I see. Uh, I just switched to the wrong screen, by the way. So you will uh, you'll see a little interruption. Uh, it's just happened. Um, consistency of measurements. Yeah, uh, that is a a difficult one. I don't know really why people worry too much about measurements because. As long as you know what you're using and what the, the plans or what the thoughts are in your head for what you're making is. Uh, it, well, a great, a great book to reference here is By Hand and Eye, which talks about um, how everything's done in proportions. Like um, on Bench Talk, uh, I think during one of our free chats, we were talking about uh, you know, making your own measuring stick. You could, you could uh, if you wanted to make something similar to the royal foot, which was used in the past. You could uh, measure your own foot and then use dividers to split that by 12 and make your own ruler, which is your own body's dimensions. Yes, no, that, that sounds an interesting idea. I've never done that myself. Um, you should, you should do a stream doing that now. I, I should try that. Ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remind me of that one. That could be fun. Now, um, Talking of that, there are all sorts of different ones, aren't they? Using like a span and using uh, the length from your elbow to your fist, is it, or to your thumb or something like that. So lots of different uh, measurements have, have happened over the years. And uh, I think as long as you work out something that works for yourself, uh, it, it goes fine. Um, I often get asked why am I using imperial measurements when I'm in Europe? Uh, well, I could say I'm no longer in Europe, but uh, geographically I am. I, I use Imperial and I use Metric and I interchange them all the time. And uh, I must admit, I don't struggle with that. Having said that, the plans which are on offer for this are actually in Metric. Um, if anyone wants some Imperial, then it, is, it would be very simple for me to change that. So do let me know and I can have options on there. As to the actual stools, anyone got any thoughts as to whether they might find them useful themselves? If I had space for them, definitely. If you have sp space, yeah. Um, the footprint, I haven't measured that. I could do that, couldn't I? That might be useful. The bases are uh, 11 inches, 280 millimeters by uh, under 23 inches, um, 580 uh, millimeters. The overall length, because the bench top's a bit, little bit longer, my one's come out at uh, 650 millimeters, which is 25 and a half inches. And the height, of course, is around about 21 inches, 530 millimeters. So I don't think they take up an awful lot of room. If there's something that you're going to use regularly, then I think it's worth having them in the workshop. And if you work with uh, large panels, then uh, certainly it's a lot easier than trying to prop things up on uh, blocks of wood on or polystyrene on the floor to run over with a circular saw and break it down. So what's the advantage of using uh, over mortising on a workbench? Um, I think the fact that A, you're sitting down, so it's more comfortable. Um, I think you can see just as well. Uh, I know there's been an argument when Peter's been here, he's uh, 
convinced he can't do it on, on, a, ben on a stool. He can only do it at a bench. Uh, I, hopefully I've disproved that uh, and maybe he'll give it a go now. Um, the fact that you can cope with parts that are much longer than your bench and you don't have to support them with additional items, supports uh, beyond your bench. You just spread these stools out as wide as you need them to hold whatever it might be. So a door style, if you've got a short bench and you want to put a door style on there, you might find it's a problem, you have to clamp it. So on these you don't have to clamp at all, you just sit on it. And of course, and what, what differentiates this from a sawhorse then? Um, is it the, just the name? <laughs> it's, you could say it's just the name. Traditionally, I would say sawhorses are a little taller and usually less sturdy. Um, obviously, that doesn't, that's not always the case. You can have very sturdy sawhorses, but often um, a sawhorse is simply to hold a piece of work up high enough to saw with. Uh, so it doesn't need to have as much rigidity as these have got uh, for when you might be chopping with say you know a half inch mortise chisel or something really pounding down on them. That's the main the main difference that I see. But equally when I've been posting these I think I've been putting um, mortising stools in brackets something like that or saw horses because uh, they can be used equally well for both. So I'm just trying to have a look at the stream myself now, try and catch up. So lots of people that I, I recognise from previous streams. So hi to you all, thanks for coming along. Chester's got something here. Why didn't I set the gussets in the ends lower so that when stacked they would sit across the lower bench instead of wedging against the legs? Then you could use it as a higher bench and apply. Yeah, I thought about that when I stacked them earlier actually. Let's just go back and see if I can show you. If I can pick the right camera this time. So the question there was, why did I do it so that when stacked, they're stacking on the, on the legs? Um, if I had put it so the gussets came down to the bench top here, then pounding on it would be pounding the gusset up between the legs. So you still got the potential then of spreading the legs. Um, but yeah, it may have been a better idea. I hadn't, when I designed them, thought, oh, I need to have. Uh, the ability to stack them because of course it's always possible just to stack them top to top uh, but if you're looking for something to be able to stack up and use as a double height uh, then by all means make longer gussets uh, if you do that make absolutely certain that your gusset is in contact tight contact with the top uh, any gap there would allow the gusset to be driven in potentially wedging the legs apart. So just a little word of caution, but yes, it might be a better idea, Chester, uh, to add length to that gusset. Personally, I wouldn't have been able to do it on this occasion because I was working from scraps I had and I didn't have anything that would have been large enough to make them any bigger than that. Um, but uh, hey, when these wear out, maybe I'll do that. Another idea. I was wondering if you could board dunk holes into the top and you could uh, use, uh, for example, the Veritas, um, Veritas to hold fast. Ah, the little... Um... The, the screw down clamp style hold fasts, uh, which work on shallow dunk holes. The screw down ones, I don't know about those, I've never tried them out. As in, rather than whacking them down with a mallet, you... Uh, Push it, push it down and then you tighten the screw. I can send you a link. I have this style which I use in my saw bench, the um, Veritas 
uh, pups, aren't they? Rather than dogs. Yeah. Uh, yes, I could put some holes in for those for clamping or for using a hole, uh, hole fast. And also, the other idea I think I mentioned in an earlier stream was maybe putting through a, a slot as a finger hole to lift them up. So, yeah, there are some options that you can do with that. Yeah, I'm just thinking it could be you could even uh, bore some dog holes onto the sides of them as well. Yeah, and down the legs. If you, ever, if you ever wanted to rest a small sheet or something to, to work on the edge, you could clamp down to or something. Plenty of opportunity to, to make it your own, do your own thing with it, absolutely. Think of it perhaps as the basis of um, a small workshop, small workbench. If you don't have a workbench yourself, expand the capabilities of these. You might want to keep, you know, a, a large plank, maybe four foot long, that you just clamp onto these, clamp across these to use as a as a workbench temporarily. It's uh, possible to come up with all sorts of different things, all different ways to use them. And also very good as a step up. Now actually on their own, I tried this earlier, they're pretty stable because they've got the splayed legs. But if you're working for longer, just interlock the legs. You've got a, a nice big platform here and it really is, you know, it's very stable. So, uh, yeah, play with it. It's a, it's a basic design. Uh, it functions as a morsing stool and then you can make it into anything else you want from there. I'd also consider if I had more materials um, to have made these from, I may have made thicker tops, slightly wider legs, and in that case it would be heavier and it would be kind of like a workshop based one. But these are very portable so the lightweight nature of the pine makes it very easy, I mean I can do single finger presses with these, they're that light. So for actually, if you're going to be moving around a lot with them, make it out of softwood. If you're only going to use them in your workshop, maybe go that extra mile, make them thicker and add a hardwood. And you know, you've got a, the basis of a, a really good workbench if you don't have room for a full size one. Ah, so Lego Man's joined us. Hi, Lego Man. So, I mean, that probably covers uh, this project now, and I think I've probably taken it as far as I, I need to go. I might do a few things just to finish them off. Uh, I may give them a coat of maybe linseed oil on the top, maybe pop uh, a little bit of emulsion on the legs, something bright so they stand out. But uh, you, you see what I it think was. I you should go for hot pink emulsion. Hot pink emulsion on the legs. Uh, yeah, that might be nice. Yeah. Certainly get people oh. talking, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All purple. Go for pink or purple. <laughs> it's a shame you didn't make the legs out of purple heart. Say no more about purple heart. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, let's, let's press on. If you've got any more comments on them, put it in the chat and I'm sure Shrenik will point it out to me. I'm going to talk about what we're going to be doing next. Well, Claudius just asked what, what will be the next project. Uh, well, I don't know about the next project. The next live stream is probably going to be trying to finish this lamp off. This is what we started. I think it was just before Christmas. And uh, as you can see, I have found a, another bulb holder. It's not ideal, but it, it will stay in there on its own quite safely. And so I can get on now and actually make a shade for it. I've been experimenting a bit with some shavings uh, that I took when I was making the closed valets. 
and I'm thinking we probably will use shavings in the in the lampshade itself. Quite how I'm going to do it is another thing. So far what I've tried is using the uh, I just realized you're not looking at what I'm looking at. This is what we're we're looking at. The um, the lamp stands all completed that we did before Christmas. I've got a bulb holder on there. Uh, looking for the, the shade itself, I'm going to be using the shavings which are all very curled up, although they're full width, they're rolled up tighter than, uh, well I can't say on a live stream, but they're very tight so I've got to work out a way to get those flat. I tried something last night and it seems to work so I'll be doing a bit more of that. I'll show you that if it works out long term. I'll show you that on the next live stream and then we'll need to design the actual shape of the the lampshade and get that built. So we'll get that finished and out of the way. Did, did you um, replace the wire with the three core? I now have nice safe wire. Um, because this lamp holder is all plastic I only need two core to that one. Ah, that's fine. Then. Uh, but I've got three core to the. Good. I've got a push uh, a foot switch for it, and uh, that's all cabled up as well. Uh, I I knew this one was safe because it's come off something else which I was throwing out, and that had um, I actually did have a metal uh, support for its shade. So I'm not quite sure how that worked, but I knew the rest of it was safe so do check out your regulations if you're doing this yourself so we'll, we'll get to finishing that off um, after that I've got a little idea about perhaps having some sort of um, joint challenge so uh, maybe to do with um, through the chat perhaps suggesting or choosing uh, what joint I might do in uh, the upcoming video, the upcoming stream, maybe even the current stream. So I'll, I'll come up with some, some joints to choose from and um, we'll have some way of picking those. Now it may be that I'll be saying uh, if you want to donate a dollar uh, you can choose and then uh, the person that gets the, or the joint that gets the most number of choices uh, will win. I don't know. But well, we come up with some, some way of choosing. We may even do something like golden shot and I can uh, move the camera around or move, move something around to pick the joint from a series of joints up on the wall. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll figure something out. Just to make it a bit more interactive, it might be nice. So, um, going beyond that, I have another plane to make. And you may see some materials behind me on this small bench. Uh, I'm going to be making a scrub plane. I'm also going to be making a smoother. And parts of those parts of those mates could be done in the actual live stream. I think it's about time you made yourself a, a mitre plane as well. Well, you say mitre plane, and uh, I say. Metal work? Uh, you can make a wooden mitre plane. Um, well, uh, I'll have to research and think about that. Possible, uh, you can, you certainly can mount, possible. You can use a, a, a wedge mount mitre plane. Wedge mount mitre plane? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea. I'm perfectly happy to try anything, so do keep your suggestions coming. I enjoyed making the shoulder plane before Christmas, so um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be making some more planes. So if I put mitre plane on the list, that'll get done. But I'm open to any suggestions for the live stream. And I've also got, as you can see behind me, a blue wall, so I could even uh, do something with that. Uh, we could have some something nice to look at whilst I'm working. So if you've got suggestions for my workshop, then uh, give me those as well. Uh, I'm going to do a, 
a tour of the workshop. I did say I would um, when I finished moving everything. But at the moment, if you, you can see probably behind me, there's nothing up on the walls. And there's also, let's move this camera around if I can. It's cabled in, but it, uh, hopefully nothing will fall, fall down. All my walls are currently bare, so I need to get some stuff put up there. Get my tool cabinet in here. Now that's the main reason why I've got the tools that I use in this project all on the bench is because uh, I didn't want to take them all the way back to the other workshop to put them away. Uh, but it actually worked out really, really well because I could show you uh, what I'd used and what I actually needed to use. Uh, another bit of news for you, I did mention it uh, in the chat to the first uh, few people who were here that I had now the COVID vaccine. So uh, I'm hoping that within a month or two I may actually get out of this place and not have to shield so much. Uh, I had what is the AstraZeneca one, the Oxford vaccine, and I had um, a day's worth of uh, fever and aches starting yesterday about midday, so about 18 hours after having had the, the vaccination. And that's pretty much worn off now. I'm pretty, back, pretty much back to normal. So if you're offered a vaccine, I do suggest you get it. It's really not too bad. Well, unless there's anything else in the chat, I'm going to go off and have a cup of tea. Let's have a little look. Have I seen Bill's video on? Um, no, I haven't. I need to check it. I've, I've got Bill's channel. Um, I think I subscribed to it. I'm sure I did. So I will go and have a look on there because he's obviously, uh, obviously the master to go and look at these days. Okay, so folks, thanks for coming. Um, oh, just spotted that at the last moment. Earl Grey. I don't personally like Earl Grey. I like PG Tips, which is just as well because the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is um, something to do with chimpanzees. So just as well I have PG Tips, I think. Oh, Mitch, it's Yorkshire tea. Yorkshire tea. Well, I like Yorkshire tea, but you know, you've got, it's got to be said, chimpanzees are all over PG tips. So you've, uh, if you have the AstraZeneca vaccine, you've got to have PG tips. Otherwise, there's some sort of conflict, I believe. <laughs> all right, folks. Good to see you all. See you next time. Cheerio.